According to the results released by the country's electoral commission, Frelimo won vote in all of Mozambique's 10 provinces. It is set to get two-thirds majority in parliament. Incumbent President Philippe Nyusi has won over 70% of the votes countrywide. Some residents are happy with the result. I'm happy that Frelimo won. I'm very happy. Party representatives are happy. The most important in this moment is including all people. Is including uh, people from opposition, from, from, from rural parties, to, 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 to working together. The official opposition party in Mozambique, Renamo, says the elections were not free and fair. Every time there are reports of election fraud, the commission is not taking any action. There's no truth here. These elections were not free and fair. We are not happy at all. The Mozambique Electoral Commission says it conducted the election in the best possible way. The results have to be handed to the Constitutional Council, which will ultimately uh, endorse and, uh, and um, uh, proclaim the winners of the election. The northern province of Cabo del Cabo did not vote due to insurgency. During the electioneering period, 250 people were killed due to clashes within political parties and among them, a local observer was killed in Shai Shai, allegedly by the state police, an action that was seen as a setback by international observers. Sipepile Gunene, SABC News, Maputo, Mozambique. For more on the Mozambique elections and other African stories that dominated our headlines this week, I'm joined in studio by Africa analyst Advocate Sipamantula from the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa. Advocate, a very good evening. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome. Thank you very much, Simpio. Evening, evening to the viewers. Jumbo Africa. Jumbo Africa, indeed. And, uh, you know, Sadak election results disputed in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. No no surprises there, are there? No, that is uh, quite true, uh, Simpio. But you must understand that there was the delay in terms of announcement uh, Observer missions uh, were uh, having different views about what what really happened. We saw from the international uh, groupings vis-à-vis -vis African grouping that there was a lot of uh, one can say different views around what has happened and the delay. And another aspect is what they use the term mega fraud. That Renamo was saying that there was a mega fraud of elections in that country meaning that they feel that there was a, a, a collapse of the peace deal uh, agreement that violence and threats to voters should not be used. Mm -hmm. Now, Renamo has been playing foul, I mean, has been crying foul. The other opposition party as well is not accepting this result. And, and uh, that's where you could say that they must opt. I think President of Zimbabwe have, have said that if there are some challenges, they must go to the courts. Do you think they will, though? Do I they think they must because, case? no, one can say that they have the systems in terms of electoral uh, justice uh, because, remember, after announcement of today, there is still the court process. Constitutional court in that country must confirm results. But there is a dispute within electoral commission members. There is a cry from opposition parties. So if they have enough evidence in terms of the voters role violence and other factors that they want to bring forward they have that option and it's almost a pattern in africa <coughs> whosoever loses um, an election yes, yes, yes. they always cry foul but uh, we still yet to see an opposition party or an, an aggrieved opposition party coming forth with concrete evidence we still haven't seen that no i think we did in pure remember 2017 we have odinga going to kenya and uhuru that was one of the landmark cases in this in this uh, region because in kenya you had a constitutional court nullifying the election results and, and pushing for the runoff. Now, in the SADC region, like you have said, Botswana, we saw an opposition party member in Khaboroni before the eve of elections raising challenges and, and, and raising that he will even go to the court. And it was around the voters role once more. So one can say that electoral management bodies, it's still that one can say that they are still stuck on the issue around the key document, which is the voters' role. The issue around counting, again, verification of election 
result is very key because it gives all the actors a fair process to say that elections have been uh, counted well and there was no any challenges that they face because this is power contestation by the way yeah, yeah. and it is used through the numbers of uh, electorates and that's where i can say to you the african commission on uh, elections as well there is a need for uh, Africa to start to focus on elections because you can look at the numbers of observer missions, you can look at the representation. Uh, Khaboroni, there was uh, less, uh, I mean, there was under representation of women in, in terms of leadership. You don't have uh, indigenous people being part of uh, parliament. So you have the guys who have learned in, in uh, England, America coming to rule Botswana. So you have the ordinary people not having power. Yeah, and speaking of Botswana, uh, there was a lot of expectation that the opposition could mount a very serious challenge to uh, the incumbent ruling party, the PDP, but then obviously it uh, emerged victorious. No, that is quite true, and I think the former president used the wrong ticket by claiming that he will be able to can win support for the opposition party. Remember that we are talking of the ruling party that has been there for more than 50 years, and that's how critical it is when you look at the history of the ruling party in that country, that traditional base support comes from the villages, but the former president had a challenge with his own strict rules in that country. And secondly, corruption. I think the young people in that country were tired of actually corrupt uh, elders or leaders in that country. And there were issues ar around, even you can look at opposition parties, that they were not even united. They're only united towards election time. Election time yeah. After uh, elections, opposition parties don't become coalitions. They become what you call coalitions of, of the willing or coalitions of uh, elections. Yeah. And uh, what happens then to Ian Khama? What happens to Duma Vogo, who became the biggest loser? I think they were still going to consider taking the matter to the court uh, as well because they were worried about the interference during campaign. They were raising the issue around voters role. But I think Khaboroni, it is one of the peaceful countries uh, that even the SADC uh, 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 head office, it is there. So uh, one, one will say that Ian Khama must consider defeat and even start to work around the next elections in 2024. Do you think uh, the incumbent president of Botswana has what it takes to change the fortunes of Botswana? I mean, he had an opportunity of doing yeah. that in the, in the previous term. I think he didn't have enough time by then. Transition or the caretaker presidency of the former president and the, and the newly elected was being disturbed by the issue around the former president and at the same time dealing with the economic crisis, the issue of the food shortage, the issue around corruption, you know. So one can say that the new leadership of that country has to work around the issue of job creation for the young people, deal with the issue of diamonds that ordinary people in that country benefit, deal with the question of animals, the rights of elephants in that country, and the diamonds, the minerals, the issue of the indigenous communities, people that they call Hore, they must deal with that community, their rights. It's very critical. And corruption in the state, I think that's one thing that has been happening in that country. So you can say that Masisi has got a challenge and to work with op opposition. Because you cannot be just the ruling party without engaging with opposition parties. And that's where you can say he has only gained one seat from the previous elections of 2014. So one can say that there will be no not be a tough time in the parliament per se, but their challenge now is to work with the national interest of the country. It's almost become a rhetoric for incumbent president to call on the opposition <clears throat> to, uh, to, the, uh, you know, to the negotiation yeah, table yeah. to chart a way forward, but uh, it's always been a rhetoric, as I've mentioned, but then it never happens. No, I think the example that we can see now should be Mozambique. Nusi, Jacinto, Felipe, Nusi must push to bring opposition party because the government of national unity yes it is the mantra but at some point you bring opposition for the issue of nation building social cohesion and even reconstruction of a economy and so i'm saying to you mozambique should push on bringing opposition parties into parliament they should not think of winners takes all because yes you have contested but they are under question marks there's a dark cloud around those elections. So it is very important that political parties during elections must always 
put into cognizance what is the national interest and what is the regional priority. Now, Africa Human Rights Day was commemorated on the 21st of October. Yeah. This very important day mm -hmm. often goes unnoticed. So, yeah. what does it mean for the continent? You know, I think what, what is important is that this year, they are still looking at the rights of refugees, uh, people who are being affected by conflicts. And like you are saying, it is said that even the media itself, it's putting the cold front on the Africa Human Rights Day, when actually when it's International Human Rights Day, they are all flighting Africa. It's a very critical day because from 1986, you had an African instrument mm -hmm. that talks about the rights of ordinary people. South Africa signed it in 1996. A critical significance of that charter imposes responsibilities even to the ordinary citizens, not only to the state. It is not only about the state to protect and promote rights. It's even for the individuals, for the media as well, to can promote the media freedoms as, as they are. So there is a challenge that South Africa have signed a charter. Many African countries delay to even report in that African commission that is in Gambia. The same Gambia took more than 19 years to even report. Mm -hmm. Countries have to report every two years. And you have South African delegates who come from Foreign Affairs, Justice Department, Human Rights Commission going to that meeting in Gambia every two years. But nobody knows what is cooking there, what is the report. And it's high time that people, when they go to such forums, they bring reports. South Africa, yes, was under scrutiny in that uh, meeting about what happened in September, the Afrophobia. The, uh, the violence against African nationals. And it was reminded of that you must put laws, you must promote human rights in your country. Yeah. And at the same time, put your national action plan on racism, xenophobia, and other forms of racism in, in your country. So I can say to you, simply, it's important to remember this African Human Rights Day more than European days. I mean, you've just mentioned some of the uh, realities that uh, Africans and, or, often face, like racism, yeah. xenophobia, yeah. but what are some of the major human rights violations that the continent is currently grappling with? You know, if we are talking of Khartoum and we are talking of Conakry, now Guinea Conakry, we have African leaders who want to stay in power for long. So you have political power contestation. You've got the issues around people who were killed in Khartoum in June, uh, impunity. You have the issue of mineral rights in this, in this region, that people are still stealing minerals in this continent. We have people going to bed without food. You have poverty levels in uh, Africa. I cannot go further about conflicts. Yes. Why there are wars in this continent? Who are the hidden hands behind it? Europeans. And you have leaders going to Russia and clinching deals around the nuclear uh, weapons. And at the same time, we are saying Africa by 2020 must silence guns. So the conflicts are the one of the major human rights violations and the power mongering. The leaders who stay into, into power, others they say and, until Jesus comes, but we don't know how. But there are people who stay into power for too long. And this is one of the major human rights violations because you have a one-party state, you have the military generals, dictators who are ruling. And you have violations of women and children's rights. And that's why many African countries are not even focusing on putting money on issues of human rights because they know it's a direct conflict with the state. Many states violate human rights and at the same time pretend to be the guarantors of human rights and the rule of law. Okay. And that's where Africa it is still struggling. Now, we've just mentioned Russia and uh, the clinching of uh, trade deals and yeah. fresh from that first ever yeah. Russia-Africa summit the past week. So, do you think it's another talk shop? I don't think so. We had almost 43 leaders going there, even if others were catching the sleep there. But uh, what is critical with that meeting of minds was that Putin was able to cancel off the uh, debt. I think that is critical. Africa has been suffocating from the foreign debt. That was critical. But I think the leaders as well were meeting on the sidelines. You have leaders from Egypt, Ethiopia meeting, Uganda, Rwanda. They were meeting there. But I think Putin was saying that the key principle is that let's uh, advocate the issue of African solution to African problems. And I think the other issue that Putin was pushing is his military agreements in many African countries. And as we are aware, South Africa has been into engagements with Russia for many years. Mm -hmm. We have our young people studying in Russia, mm -hmm. and we have Russia pushing the nuclear uh, energy, which I think, again, we have to be very careful. 
we have to understand that the nuclear energy must not affect environment. It yeah. must not even benefit the elites. We must have, we must go green in this region, in this continent, but we must not suffocate the mother nature environment. And it's critical that these nuclear deals must not be only to can combat conflicts in the continent. And I think it's also critical that we place under the microscope uh, the kind of uh, you know, intentions mm -hmm. that Russia has for mm -hmm. the African continent. I mean, uh, when Russia enters into the African space, do you mm -hmm. think it's uh, for purposes of uh, perhaps countering the kind of influence that China has on the continent? One cannot say so. Russia is in Pew and Russia, Russia, China, South Africa, Brazil, they are under the BRICS bloc. What is critical, we can say Russia it is trying to close down on the Western influence from America, from Britain, that have an influence in the continent. Russia is coming back after the Soviet days of 1991. So Russia it is trying to claim its role in the continent. And they are aware that the issues of health risk, Ebola, you find Russia was in Congo, the issues of military training in Kampala, in Mozambique. So Russia, you can say it is repositioning itself but at the same time kremlin is having challenges there are some domestic politics that putin has been facing in that country but it's very clear that it's coming to the continent at the right time because africa is talking about unity it's talking about integration it's talking trade it is talking silencing guns but surprisingly he's doing the opposite he's bringing the military technology he's telling african leaders invest on military technology and at the same time africa is saying but we want to silence the, the guns the guns yeah and uh, the past <coughs> week we saw the united nations security council visiting uh, southern uh, i mean south sudan the mm -hmm. past week and holding talks with african union council so where and uh, uh, how is the un diplomacy and african diplomacy converge where is that nexus between <coughs> those two platforms you know simpio i think the un it is still struggling and not having the signal and the data of understanding African politics. We had South Africa chairing the UN Security Council this month. It, it now goes into Juba, trying to insist on the government of national unity next month on the 12th, which is critical. And when you look at the politics of that country, integration of the military forces of both sides, it is the sticking point. The issue of integration, the issue around poverty levels, but again, the UN goes in there without even understanding the issue around the safety of Rikmachar. They are only looking at Rikmachar's safety. But what about ordinary people? What about civilians? And you have the highest and the expensive peacekeeping mission in that country that the UN, it is even, uh, one can say, proud about, but there is, there is no peace. So one can say that the African diplomacy was meeting in Djibouti, the group, of IGAT where was meeting in Djibouti, Ethiopia, and to find the solution between Rikmacha and Salvakiri because both leaders, like I have said before, the founding fathers in Africa are losing the issue around conflict mediation. Now the UN has failed Africa. The South Sudan, DRC, we have the highest peacekeeping missions there, but there is no peace, there, there is no justice. So you ask yourself, Diplomacy must lead to cultural harmony, cultural unity amongst the people, not conflicts. Now you find that, like I said to you, you there are blue helmets in the South Sudan, but people are dying on a daily basis. Mm. Then you have diplomats staying in fancy hotels, traveling to these meetings and claiming to understand what is on the ground when actually they don't have a clear signal and a clear data of a community politics. I mean, the, the fact that uh, the wheels came off the past week and the negotiations between Reik Mashar and Salva Kiir hit mm -hmm. a brick wall. Yeah. Uh, I mean, can there ever be peace in South Sudan? Can that peace deal ever hold between you the two know, leaders? You know, I think simply it has failed several times. We have tried it on this show to talk about it. And I think the main sticking part is that you have leaders who are greedy, who are inwardly looking, and they don't look at the vision of the of the late John Garang Di Mabiyo, who wanted a united Sudan, who wanted the, the young that people of the Sudan. Obstacle, though, because this peace deal brought so much hope <laughs> and uh, promise to South Sudan. No, the issue that I spoke, they have more than 83,000 militants. You have a country that's got more soldiers, more generals, and the oil issue. There is an oil 
There are minerals in that country. So the sticky issue is around minerals. It's around the military worshipping. And it's around the founding fathers' notion that the founding fathers of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement are the ones who have power. Mm. And that's where you have the sticking part. And you have a challenge of the UN, like I say, imposing mediation rather than looking at the African way of mediating, which it means we stay long on a dispute by trying to get a mediation process going. Mm -hmm. But we have people who parachute mediation and who stick into their timelines that are not even feasible. And that's where the issue of Rikmacha is raising the issue around the military integration and the funding. I have said it before in this show that the money issue, it is the sticky point. Okay. Now, today is the, uh, the day of birth for ANC stalwart uh, Oliver Reginald Tambo. He's not only a South African icon, but, yeah. uh, you know, he's a continental icon, as it were. So let's extend our analysis into the kind of legacy and the influence he had on the continent. Mm. You know, Kaisana Ol Oliver Reginald Tambo, if you look at his history, from Lusaka to many countries in Angola, Ethiopia, and Africa, he has played this critical role by pushing for the African solidarity. He was able to write many letters to the OAU Liberation Committee, pushing the struggle of South Africa. He had an exchange letter in 1964 mm -hmm. with the then chairperson of the Organization of African Unity, Haile Selassie, telling him about the plight of people of this country, telling him more about acknowledging the role of the OAU Liberation Committee. So the role of Oliver Tambo is beyond politics, science, Technology. He was a mastermind of understanding development. He was a mastermind of understanding diplomacy in a simple level, not a European diplomacy, but an African, pan-African vision. He was a lawyer, by the way. He looked at the issues of human rights in the continent. And that's where when you think of his legacy, that Oliver Tambo's legacy in the continent was to link South Africa and the whole continent. Hence, he had a close relation with people like Kenneth Kaunda. He had a close relation, like I said to you, with people like Haile Selassie. He had a close relationship with people like Nkrumah, as well as people like Nyerere. So there was a clear link of the legacy of Oliver Tambo. The only set issue about his legacy is the current crop of leadership that we see in Africa that are not learning from diplomacy of Oliver Tambo. And that's why I can say to you, the legacy that is left behind by Oliver Tambo has to be education, has to be liberation, has to be cultural diplomacy. He was a cultural diplomat, by the way. He was a person of drama, a person of music. Mm -hmm. He loved a lot of things that I think the young people of today, if they can think of a leader, just being speaking nice English only in or, or even traveling. But Oliver Tambo was a leader of stature, a character. Mm -hmm. And like I said to you, an in internationalist. He looked at the broader struggle of this country and of Africa in the context of the UN. Hence, he pushed for South Africa on the issue of sanctions, that South Africa must be ostracized, must be put outside African, I mean, uh, world politics because of apartheid. So he pushed for apartheid to be, to be labeled as a crime against humanity. So one can say that it is important, simply when we think of the legacy of Kaisana Oliver Reginald Tambo in the broader context outside Azania and outside South Africa. When you speak of a facet of his legacy being one of connecting South Africa with the rest of the continent, mm -hmm. uh, but looking at what's happening in, mm. in, in Africa, mm. particularly in South Africa, mm. where uh, foreign nationals, particularly mm. African migrants, are being mm. ostracized mm. in South Africa and they're being violated in one way mm. or the mm. other. Do you think he would be happy with uh, what's happening? I don't think he will. And a pity he has passed on after getting a stroke in the early, late 90s. After that stroke, I think that's where we lost that visionary leader. Mm -hmm. But I think he will not have been happy. He will not be happy even with how the political parties and the political leaders are so inwardly looking and, and so greedy in terms of looking at their own pockets, nepotism, corruption, and not even understanding African politics. He'll, he'll be worried about leaders who, who lack African politics 101, who lack to understand geography, biography of Africa. So I can say to you, he'll not even be happy about leaders who go to Europe and still preach African solidarity when actually they are after European money. So he will not be happy about that, but the young people, he will have loved the young people to yeah. go for excellence in terms of science and technology because that's where Africa is moving, African 
indigenous knowledge systems. Advocate Africa shall rise and Africa should rise and Africa will rise. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for your insights. Well, that was Africa analyst advocate Sipomantula from the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa.